Hello. Hi, Serena. How are you? Good, good. Hi, Z. So excited. <laughs> So excited to hear about astrocytes. Yeah, me too. I'm very excited. Hi, Moritz. Uh, am I saying your name right? Or Moritz? I'm not sure. <laughs> Moritz, Moritz. How are you? Hello, Moritz. Uh, your mic is still muted. In the lower right, there's a microphone you could unmute. Can you hear us? If you're on your phone, it's all the way on the bottom right hand. There should be a little microphone symbol. And if you press on it, you should be able to unmute. Uh, if that, the, yes. oh, there we go. Hey. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I had problems with the output first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no worries. Welcome. Okay, we can hear you now. How are you today? Yeah. Hi, Victoria. How are you today? Let's say it again. Sorry. Oh, hello. Hello, everyone. I'm well. Thank you. Nice to see you, Katarina, Serena, Moritz. Welcome, welcome. We have an astrocyte room. It's my favorite oh, topic. Finally. <laughs> so excited. I'm so happy. Thank you. <laughs> This is why we've been doing this. The whole the whole reason is for this astrocyte room. Our whole life led up to this moment. <laughs> <laughs> and Maurice, no kidding. Almost every chance I get, if the topic is even, if I can see an astrocyte angle, I go there. <laughs> Um, that, that's exciting to hear. <laughs> Astrocytes get a weird fall. Not, not weird. You get, get a sort of an eclectic mix of people interested in it. Well, I've really gotten the sense that there's been such a deep, um, you know, renaissance of their function in the last, what, decade or so. Would you, would you say that? Yes, to some extent, I think to some extent, sort of, there's still, still a lot missing. Sort of, there's, for example, I mean, there's a lot of work has been done, sort of, on like gliotransmission, where astrocytes release various factors, neuro, release neurotransmitters, release glutamate, release a lot of other things, and sort of there's enough been done to show that they do it but very little on like very little is advanced on sort of like understanding what triggers it how it gets released where it gets released so sort of a lot of those tools have really sort of stagnated to some extent in the last decade i would say oh really because i mean i've um I've taken such an interest in, you know, calcium waves throughout the syncytium and how they may contribute to um, so many, 
you know, higher level processes and in the sense of, you know, a sort of dialogue between neurons and these waves in the sensation. Um, I'll be really interested to hear your work and, and get a, you know, a good discussion going. Yeah. Okay, but, but so, I mean, for example, I think astrocyte calcium is, hasn't really advanced much. I mean, sort of, there's been really nice work on the calcium waves and the calcium sparklets and, and out in the processes, but sort of really connecting that to like what comes out, it's sort of all very crude of you have a, have some sort of like secondary measure of some gliotransmitter and you sort of vaguely correlate it to calcium, but sort of everything gets vaguely correlated to calcium and there's no real, like, nobody's sort of figured out really exactly what triggers these calciums or like what's downstream of it. Or like, how do you go from a calcium sparklet or a calcium wave to DC ring getting released or ADP getting released or something else? I mean, it's sort of, I think it's been the limits of we have great calcium tools, which makes calcium easy, but we don't really have or haven't had the tools to sort of go after the, like, what comes next. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and do they, um, you know, and, and I also look at the, you know, the whole tripartite synapse and, you know, like, curious and about do these waves then you know there's some reports of you know potent you know um potentiating postsynaptic neurons uh in long-term potentiation or is that i mean are these waves somehow driving neural synchrony like in other reports or you know what what's really going on there yeah no, i mean there's the, definitely really good work on it to some extent but sort of uh, i think it hasn't sort of coming from like the neuronal side sort of where there's been so much work and sort of like we really know like what a synapse does as in how it works of calcium entry vesicle release or like everything sort of connected and i mean we don't understand everything but sort of like we at least know the like pathway for everything mm. And I think sort of like, there's just sort of like key, key steps missing in the pathway. So, I mean, for example, I mean, one of the interesting things on astrocyte calcium is when you stimulate neurons, you don't get a repeatable astrocyte calcium signal, which is sort of like completely different from like, any like neuronal function we, we look at and sort of it, it makes sort of like calcium as like calcium signaling on a really like mechanistic level hard because you just can't like give the same stimulus and get the same calcium signal out it, it just becomes there's sort of clearly something in between that we don't really understand yeah they're kind of moody aren't they <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I mean, sort of, there's clearly a lot of calcium activity going on, but sort of, sort of, to me, it always seems like it's hard to make tractable if, I mean, if I can't evoke it the same way repeatedly, it's sort of like, it becomes much more difficult to study. Well, so doesn't that suggest that there's, there's timing and context there? That we're missing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, I think a lot of it is probably context. Sort of, we don't really know what state the astrocytes are in. That clearly matters for if you're going to invoke a calcium wave or not, or a calcium spark or not. But till we have like a tool to sort of really like at least define what an astrocyte state is in that sort of sense. It, or at least nobody's really, like, even as far as I know, concretely found a way to go after that. 
Well, you're being very cautious, and and I certainly respect that. Um. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's biased by my own interest and my own sort of like ideas of what I think is tractable for for my projects and my experiments is is also the thing of like there's a lot of interesting and really novel stuff on like astrocyte calcium with in vivo and with behavior which is not exactly my expertise is for in terms of like experiments and projects i do which is also sort of just biases me towards I like when I have controlled situations where I can stim and where I can get repeatable things that I can sort of manipulate and try to dissect. Right. It can easily be a slippery slope. And, you know, and sometimes in Clubhouse, you know, the conversation wanders from, my, you know, we like to keep a high standard of science here, but then, you know, we'll get off into discussions of behavior and then philosophy and the hard yeah. problem of consciousness. And it, you know, it all goes everywhere, but. Um, I'm really excited that, about this topic, and um, I guess we can um, start to get started here pretty soon. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's uh, start. So thank you for the pre pre conversation. <laughs> it was really already interesting. So thank you for that. And um, because sometimes usually this waiting time. It can get kind of boring, but you guys made it interesting, so perfect. <laughs> I couldn't resist. <laughs> so yeah, welcome everyone to Science Society and a special uh, warm welcome uh, to Moritz um, here. And um, let me introduce you to the audience a little bit uh, before we start. Um, so Dr. Moritz, Ambrose, he's a research assistant professor in neuroscience at Tufts, and um, he uh, did his Bachelor of Science at Cooper Union and his um, PhD at Rockefeller University. And um, his um, um, research areas of interest are focused on astrocyte neuron interactions and how these astrocytic functions uh, can modulate synaptic and somatic neural function. And he has found novel neural control of astrocytic glutamate um, clearance kinetics um, uh, with synapse specificity and fast kinetics. And um, in order to, um, you know, investigate or answer some questions he has around that. He uses a combination of astrocyte and neural electrophysiology and cutting edge li life imaging of glutamate, calcium, voltage, and other biosensors. So, yeah, he's, Moritz uh, is doing really amazing research. And before you start with, um, you know, with um, basically with the talk about this, uh, you know, your your ongoing research and, you know, the latest uh, or the publication we mentioned. Victoria usually asks our guest speakers like a couple of more general questions, if that's okay, like a short interview and so that the audience gets to know you as a researcher. Maybe a little bit more before we go like to the hard science, if that's okay with you. Sure. All right, here we go. Thank you, Katarina, for that fantastic introduction. And Moritz, welcome. Science Society welcomes you. We are so happy that you're here to discuss astrocytes with you. You have no idea. Well, maybe now you have a little bit of an idea. Um, so yeah, to help carry us into your discussion about your work with astrocytes, I would like to ask you if you can look back through your life and reflect on a time that you noticed that you felt an affinity towards science, and that could be maybe when you were a child, maybe a relative or family tradition, or maybe some part of your education, but some time that you noticed that you felt really connected to science. I mean, I've been interested in science for a, for a long time, even growing up, 
I mean, it it varied a lot in the directions of science. And in growing up, I would never have predicted that I would have gone into biology. Sort of biology was the least interesting to me. I was much more on the sort of like engineering, mechanical type things. Yes. I mean, what really got me into biology and interest in biology was a professor in undergraduate and that really excited me. And then I started sort of like going more to sort of lectures at Rockefeller, like on the side. And there are sort of some, a, a few presentations looking at sort of the noise and stochasticity in biological systems really got me excited and really like sort of pushed me towards switching over from more of an engineering background to towards biology and neurobiology specifically. All right. Thank you. Thank you for, for going there with us. And, and it's interesting to hear how many people do switch their fields of interest and and so then beyond that can you walk us through the path that has brought you to your current research maybe some um some areas of interest that will bring us to the research that you're doing today so so my, my sort of like scientific and biological background is i mean i did my phd with Tim Ryan at Rockefeller, and it was sort of highly focused on presynaptic neuronal function, but also highly focused on using optical techniques, using whatever fluorescent sensors we could get our hands on and make work to really piece, dissect like fundamental mechanisms controlling the vesicle cycle uh, and sort of that really sort of set a lot of my approach to uh, the science of like really like try to get at the mechanistic and try to sort of find find the best tool for the job and when I moved to Tuft sort of I really sort of switched from the neuronal side to the astrocytic side and it seemed like there was at the time, new sensors and new techniques coming out that could really start to open up um, new new areas of investigation. And Tufts has a strong strong core of researchers interested in astrocytes, which really helped and really drove both my interest there. And, and that's sort of like, and combining those is sort of like how I come to uh, sort of the type of research that we're going to be talking about today of sort of trying to utilize new and cutting edge sort of fluorescent and imaging approaches to piece out new new ideas and new biology in, in neurons and astrocytes. Well, thank you very much. And at this point, you're welcome to begin your presentation and know that uh, if you would like to have your Q&A following your discussion, then that's great. And if you'd like to have the Q&A sort of driving your discussion along the way, then that's entirely up to you. And we will take care of um, bringing guests up to ask you questions and navigate questions that are in the room chat and you can just relax and and discuss. Okay, sounds good. And I mean, absolutely feel free to break in and interrupt with questions. I think that is always helpful and useful in terms of driving the conversation. Great. And and in addition, um, I just would say to friends that do come up to, to interrupt <laughs> and ask uh, Dr. Arbrister, any questions to please flash your mics first so that we can call on you and make sure that everybody's voice is heard. So thank you very much. And uh, the mic is yours. Okay, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. And so today 
I wanted to talk about our new study on looking at depolarizations in fine astrocyte processes. And this is sort of something that we've sort of been building up for for a while. You know, but I think before I go into the meat of the astrocyte biology that we discovered, I wanted to give a quick introduction to sort of the techniques and the tools we're using because I think these genetically encoded voltage sensors that have been developed by in over the last 10 years are really exciting tools and I think have really started to reveal new new biology that wasn't accessible before. So in our study we used two different were two different voltage sensors. One is called ArcLight, which was developed in the Pirabone lab at Yale, which is essentially utilizes a voltage sensing domain from a voltage sensitive phosphatase tied to a pH sensitive GFP. While the other one is a completely different molecule, it's derived from, it's called Archon, and it's derived from an archaeorhodopsin proton pump that Adam Cohen at Harvard figured out that in addition to the optogenetic use of it for pumping protons, it had a completely separate voltage sensitive fluorescence in the far red. And these have been further developed. The Archon version that we're using was, was further evolved by Ed Boyd at MIT. And what they really provide is they now provide a, a method to, in a highly localized and fast manner, we can start imaging, imaging the voltage of a neuron or of an astrocyte or of any other cell type. And what this really has enabled is we can start getting at subcellular voltage changes. Like one of the first uses was sort of comparing the action potential waveform at a soma versus far out on the axon in the synapse. And that this, that there were clearly differences and that this could drive different behavior at the synapse that would normally go undetected by traditional electrophysiology because normally we patch a soma and Rarely and in very low throughput do people patch presynaptic boutons or postsynaptic structures. So this really sort of these these two tools and these are by our by no means are the only ones. In the last decade, there's like every year several new versions have been published, and they all have sort of their strengths and weaknesses. So Archon is very dim by fluorescence standards, while arc light sort of is not as good kinetically as Archon of like Archon can really follow an action potential, arc light is a little slower. So they each have all still, they're not perfect is the short answer and they're not quite as easy to use as G-camps these days, but they're constantly being developed and I think these are really exciting tools. So what, what really drove our interest in starting to voltage image astrocytes was this, this finding that Katerina alluded to of where we found that astrocytes dynamically seem to control glutamate clearance. So as a bit of background, sort of astrocytes have these really fine processes that a lot of the time wrap around synapses. And these are packed full of, one of, one of the things are packed full of glutamate transporters so that when excitatory synapses release glutamate, in the astrocytes need have the transporters to take up the glutamate before it activates too many things. And sort of, if you don't have it, and, you get essentially seizures from overactivation. And one of the things, curious things we found was 
then neuronal activity would control the rate of glutamate clearance, but that it was really the like, amount of stimuli and not the amount of glutamate. And this was sort of something really puzzling for us because none of it really made a lot of sense of like, how is the neuronal activity slowing a glutamate transporter on an astrocyte? And especially if it's not the amount of glutamate. So that had us sort of scratching our head for a long time. And we tried many different things. And pretty much the only hypothesis we could come up with was that these astrocytes must be locally depolarizing because these glutamate transporters are, are highly voltage dependent. Now, the thing that sort of like made the hypothesis feasible is that astrocytes are rather funny cells in terms of electrophysiology. So we and others have patched astrocytes for a long time, but contrary to neurons, they are very leaky. And so what I mean by that is in a neuron, when you patch a neuron and you can voltage clamp it at whatever voltage you want, you can pretty much voltage clamp most of the neuron. That it's resist the membrane resistance is high enough that when you control the soma, you control a large uh, space, sort of the space clamp of the cell. Well, astrocytes are extremely leaky. So there was a really nice paper that did the like heroic experiment of dual patching a single astrocyte soma, and they found they couldn't voltage clamp one side of the soma to the other. And sort of, it turns out you have a space clamp of three microns about. So what that, what that really means is that when we patch the astrocyte soma, the voltage record there can be way, way, way different than what's happening out in the processes. And these processes are the sites where they really interact with the neurons and where we think is sort of the key, the key element for a lot of the neuronal function, the neuronal astrocyte like interplay and interfunction that they do. So that that is what really drove and pushed us to sort of try to voltage image astrocytes and gave us hints that there might be something exciting there. So in our paper sort of, we sort of first expressed these two voltage sensors in astrocytes using AAV, so in adeno-associated viruses, sort of like gen viral tools to express these sensors in a cell type specific manner in mice in the cerebral cortex. So everything, everything we did essentially we focused on the cortex uh, and specifically the like somatosensory cortex, just because it's it's the system we have the most experience with and is well established in our lab. And sort of the first thing we discovered that sort of really jumped out and kept us really hooked that we had something exciting was when we looked at the kinetics of our voltage imaging signal versus the signal when we would patch clamp an astrocyte, our voltage imaging signal would decay about 10 times faster. So when you patch clamp an astrocyte, you get a depolarization when you like activate neurons. So all of this, so, so sorry, just sort of clarify, like all of this is where examining an astrocyte and activating axons that come into the astrocyte's domain. So it's sort of triggering neuro neuronal and synaptic activity in its domain to essentially evoke glutamate release, to evoke um, every, anything else that these pretty much excitatory axons are going to release and that the astrocytes are going to respond to. So 
in this sense, sort of like the first thing that really jumped out was that the decay kinetics things were re pretty much an order of magnitude faster. And this really at least was getting close to sort of what we had found in our previous like glutamate study that sort of everything in our glutamate study sort of recovered on a really fast time scale, fast, even faster than what we saw here with the voltage imaging, but that gets into really fine details, but sort of it at least sort of checked that we were on the right path. So, and we sort of started by looking at the kinetics because mainly because sort of the amplitude and sort of calibrating the amplitude was is a challenge and just sort of remains one of the big challenges with voltage imaging. But from there sort of we moved on to trying to figure out exactly like when we when we get this voltage fluorescent voltage signal from our astrocytes, where exactly is it coming from? Is it sort of dispersed? Is it coming from the soma? Uh, is it, what's sort of the spatial component of it? And this is sort of part of the project that sort of took a long time and sort of like a lot of challenging analysis to convince ourselves that what we were seeing was really true and that we would believe it ourselves and that we could sort of trust it and sort of we tried to sort of challenge it and with many sort of many sort of different approaches and sort of what we found is that uh, the majority of the signal was coming from very small hot spots so on the order of a micron or less and really sort of pushing the limits of like our the spatial resolution of the microscopes we're using. And we did sort of a lot of work of sort of trying to like overlay it to try to figure out the really precise, as precise of a spatial component as we could. And what we sort of found was that and, and we get sort of these hot spots that are uh, oblong with the short axis being on the order of half a micron and the long axis being on the order of, of one and a half to sort of two or three microns. And sort of what we, th what we really think is going on there is that this really could be like a fine astrocyte process that is sort of touching a synapse. That is sort of, you really get the like end of a process get a really focal depolarization there and then due to the about three micron space clamp you get a bit of a propagation of the depolarization along the process and that's why you get this sort of like oblong shape so sort of to give a little background on sort of astrocyte morphology is that astrocytes have I sort of always term them fuzzballs because they have a fairly small cell body and then are extremely ramified with lots and lots of fine processes that go honestly beyond the diffraction and beyond what we can resolve. So by EM, the like fine astrocyte processes that like touch synapses are on the order of a hundred nanometers or so, which is well below what we can resolve, but sort of, and that's sort of the like caveats I'll throw in of we're really pushing the limits of what we can resolve in the spatial and sort of the spatial hotspots, the size are probably filtered by our microscope, our point spread function. So I, I don't want to really say that they're precisely half a micron by the three microns. It's more that they are really small and pretty much as at the limits of our resolution where we can really put a size on it. But what is clear is they don't really happen at the soma. They really happen, they don't even really happen at the primary processes. So for this, we 
double labeled the astrocytes with a cell filler, cell fill with the TT tomato. And this is sort of the top of figure three, where you can really see the like the soma, the primary process, and then all these sort of like hot spots. And they're pretty much excluded from the primary process. They're excluded from the soma. And they really, everything we can do really points to them being at or close to the synapse. So quick question. Yes. So what, what, from what I'm getting here is your, your, at least the thinking behind this is that the, the synaptic activity, which is on the length scale of what, 100 nanometers or so is initiating these depolarizations, but they're spreading out microns and, and sort of like, the from the leaves into the branches as it were but not to the trunk or anything necessarily yeah exactly so well, it, that part gets a bit more complicated and i can touch on that later but sort of it's essentially that is the idea that the, the polarization sort of initiate with a synapse and then sort of you get a spread onto essentially down the process and sort of it falls off on the order of a micron, a few microns. That's exactly sort of how we're picturing it. And I mean, there's with the caveats of like exactly how fine these are of like, we can't really resolve the finest processes, honestly. <laughs> but sort of, Mm -hmm. And sort of like one of the things that we really did to sort of like convince ourselves that were that this is sort of the case is if we, if we put in sort of a second stimulator and activate a different pathway, so sort of we get completely non-overlapping depolarizations. That sort of like if we activate one set of synapses, we get one set of depolarizations, and if we activate a second set of synapses, we get a different one. Sort of really suggesting that and this is synaptic and really like highly localized synaptic. But then sort of like, as we sort of alluded to, it was sort of one of the big questions is sort of like exactly what on the synapse is driving it. And sort of the other really big question is sort of like was, was it's nice to sort of see a depolarization, but the really significance comes when we can put a number on sort of how big is this depolarization? Because so we know from the patch, our patch clamp studies and other patch, other people's patch clamp studies, if you record at uh, the soma, you get a one, two, three millivolt depolarization or so, which all in all isn't much to get excited about. So the other electrophysiological property of astrocytes is, is they're not just really leaky of low membrane resistance. They, they, they're fairly permeable to potassium, which sets their resting membrane potential. So they're very hyperpolarized. They rest around minus 80 to minus 90 millivolts, so close to the potassium equilibrium. And the sort of the one of the things we did was sort of we went through an extensive sort of calibration to sort of try to put a number on how big these like hotspot depolarizations are in terms of amplitude. And we did this by essentially washing on different higher potassium solutions to sort of depolarize everything to sort of known, n known levels. So like we can patch clamp and see that adding 10 millimolar potassium to the bath is going to depolarize it by 20 millivolts. Adding five is going to depolarize it by 10 millivolts. And sort of using that as a calibration, doing that by EFIS and by voltage imaging, we got a calibration that puts our hotspots at pretty close to a 20 millivolt depolarization, which is sort of compared to the SOMA that gets about a two millivolt depolarization is huge and sort of I think way bigger than what anybody really pictured an astrocyte doing because everybody has sort of thought that astrocytes are 
largely largely passive electrophysiologically of i mean there's a few currents like glutamate currents but it doesn't really change their memory potential much that's at least been the thought and sort of seeing that we were getting hot spots of 20 millivolts really sort of a sort of convinced us that sort of our initial thought that this could actually be modified modulating glutamate clearance is potentially feasible because now when these transporters see a 20 millivolt change but it also sort of really highlighted the ex excitement that this voltage imaging approach could really show us something new that we hadn't seen before. So then, th then we get to the sort of question of what really is driving these changes and sort of you know, we start, start to try to piece, piece out the different components of what the neuronal activity, what parts of the neuronal activity are required. And so we had some clear predictions and because, for example, we know that these, neuro these synapses release glutamate and that glutamate uptake into the astrocytes through the glutamate transporters drives a current, a current that should be depolarizing sort of. So we would clearly predict that glutamate and glutamate uptake should be a part of it and and so we essentially in figure six go through a lot of pharmacology to really nail just really like piece out what's required and sort of like we clearly need presynaptic activity and without it we're not we're not directly activating the astrocytes with a stimulator so that was sort of like more of a control and where it got really we we did the glutamate transporters with the blocker TF TBOA, which essentially blocks all of the glutamate transporters, and that clearly affected the peak of the depolarization, is pretty much as we predicted. But sort of the notable thing was, it it wasn't the primary component of it. What looked to be the primary component is actually potassium release from the, the neurons. So we tested this by either overexpressing the astrocytic potassium channel KR4.1. So this is an inwardly rectifying potassium channel that's critical for potassium buffering by astrocytes. And that's been explored in the astrocyte literature for a couple decades now. And sort of, so we either overexpressed it to sort of enhance the potassium buffering or blocked it with a low concentration of barium. And that, that bidirectionally modulated the depolarization and by a decent magnitude. Now what, th th this also brings up a sort of, a sort of interesting component that had us at a scratching our head a little bit of when we patch clamp an astrocyte and record the potassium currents through care 4.1 at the soma, we get a depolarizing current of potassium flows into the astrocyte in, and we get depolarizing current. Whereas when we look at our voltage imaging, when we, when we block the KIR 4.1, we actually get a bigger depolarization. So at the SOMA, when we record it, if we block it, we block the depolarization, but in the process, in, in these, these out in the processes, we, it enhances it. So it really goes the opposite direction. So what we think is going on is that there's actually the potassium is doing two different things. One is a, a current through these potassium channels into the astrocyte. And that's what we see at the soma. So when potassium flows in, it's a depolarizing current, and we see that at the soma. What we see in the processes is that 
extracellular potassium builds up and that directly depolarizes the astrocyte. So essentially it changes the nurse potential or the like potassium reversal potential. And that directly, rather than through a current, just sort of directly depolarizes. So that's sort of how, how we sort of understand this, that we see different effects of the, K, of the potassium and the KR channels out in the processes and versus what we see traditionally at the soma. Now, one of these sort of like elements to the potassium that was really surprising and sort of still has us scratching our head a bit is that the postsynaptic receptors, so the NMDA receptors and the AMPA receptors, don't seem to contribute at all to the depolarization. So we tested this by essentially doing a control or blocking or in the same cells, blocking the receptors with well-established pharmacology of DNQX or APV and really had no effect. And this was sort of really surprising because we figured in sort of the literature sort of figures that these postsynaptic receptors contribute a lot to potassium buildup because they pass potassium and they probably pass should pass more potassium than what's coming off the presynaptic side through KV channels. And honestly, we don't have a complete understanding of what's going on with that, honestly. And there's some really interesting work that came out recently from Matthew Parsons that pre and postsynaptic sides of the neuron really see astro see differences in astrocyte function and sort of probably to differences of astrocyte interactions and that this really could be contributing that these astrocytes maybe are highly biased towards the presynaptic side of the of the synaptic terminal and that's sort of the best understanding and explanation we have there. But it's something that we're absolutely interested in, would love to sort of like figure out how to get at that and, and get at that better and more. But so sort of like to put this together now of like how we see the whole picture is what we think is going on is neuronal activity out in the presynaptic terminal is releasing potassium into the extracellular space. The thing which makes this work is that the extracellular space, especially around the synapse, is very, very small. So there's really nice EMs of like how astrocytes wrap around the synapse, and you can sort of really see that there is very little space there, so that even small releases of potassium will increase the concentration there quite a bit and sort of we think the concentration is going up by close to 10 millimolar which is sort of huge on the potassium literature but but the point is that this is a highly highly focal like build up of potassium that this potassium will in a fairly short time tens to hundred of milliseconds will diffuse away or get taken up by the astrocyte. And so you never really get a bulk increase of potassium, which sort of all the potassium literature is mostly based on sort of potassium sensitive electrodes that are for sort of put into the tissue slice. And that sort of records much more of these sort of like bulk global changes. And they, they really don't seem big global changes for the levels of activity we see when there's like seizures and like ongoing sustained activity they get up to like 10 millimolar changes but that's really under like seconds to minutes long uh, ongoing firing 
So really, what really, really think is sort of like, there's these highly localized pockets of potassium loba, and they then depolarize the astrocyte, which we think then like feeds back onto the glutamate transporters and probably, and there's probably a lot of other downstream targets of this. But we focus on the glutamate transporters because there we have the best handle on and the best tools to assay it. And so we see that our manipulations of our depolarization sort of mimic themselves with effects on the glutamate transporters of hyperpolarizing it enhances function, depolarizing it decreases function, and that is sort of like binds up and makes sense. So that's sort of like where we left this study. And I think, but I think this opens up many sort of new questions to me of like, what's really going on in these like tiny pockets of like extracellular space around these synapses, both in terms of like potassium buildup of like glutamate diffusion clearance and how this potassium is going to affect not just the astrocyte side, but the neuronal side of the neuronal side is probably going to be affected and should be, there should be signs on the neuronal side that there is focal changes of potassium around it. It's again, sort of a question of getting these gavies and these tools into into the presynaptic side and, and sort of like getting the assays working of trying to figure out like what there is the most sensitive to changes in extracellular potassium but on the astrocyte side there's also there's nice studies and reports that suggested that for example that l-type voltage gated calcium channels are expressed in, and functional in astrocytes and sort of this was always one of the questions of when would these ever get activated? And sort of like this at least provides a putative mechanism of like that we get large depolarizations large enough that that could potentially activate the voltage gated channels. And suggest that maybe there is much more going on in these astrocyte processes than we've been able to sort of like record or like appreciate so far. Thank you so much for this, you know, amazing presentation and work uh, that you've been doing. It's so interesting and uh, it leads me to so many more questions and that's why it's really cool and amazing. So <clears throat> are you planning on maybe combining either very local um, uncaging of like glutamate on specific synapses or you know using some optogenetic tools with very precise um, uh, lasers that you can just elicit specific synapses like um, you know glutamate or activity uh, in very specific synapses and see what happens in the astrocytes because you know there are synapses that prefer to um to end up on the boutons and then there are synapses that prefer to um, be on shafts and also more distal more proximal and you know we kind of know that these generates different upstates and different type of threshold like changes different threshold levels in neurons could you imagine that you know there are also different types of synapse presynaptic sites that generate different pockets of um yeah of, of yeah. change in, in the astrocytes yeah. absolutely and, and i completely agree with your thinking that we, I mean, we already know from like EM, really nice EM studies that astrocyte like enchantment of synapses is highly variable. 
and I mean, numbers vary. I think in the cortex, it sort of, I think the number is somewhere around 50% of synapses have like a closely adjacent astrocyte process. The other half don't. Mm-hmm. And so I think there's that, there's, com- there's these synapses onto like boutons versus onto shafts or that uh, it's both like in like excitatory cells or like onto interneurons that really don't have the like spines. And I, th- I think that's something we absolutely want to go after because was, like you said, sort of, they really should be different. Their like astrocytic coverage is probably different. They're like, whatever the ultra structure is, we know it's different. So, and I think a lot of this is highly dependent on the ultra structure. So the tools to get at it are tricky. <laughs> so we've tried a lot of optogenetics and sort of a lot gets, it's not impossible, but a lot gets really confounding because you know, yeah, we, we would love to sort of like highly vocally like depolarize an astrocyte, but there was sort of a, a couple of nice papers that really established that pretty much all the like optogenetic channels like actually increase extracellular potassium a lot. So it's sort of really like a mix of, of really like figuring out what tools can we really get sort of a clean manipulation. So we're absolutely working on that. And these that's absolutely directions we want to go. And I think in some of it we can do by sort of targeting, like trying to label these these types of synapses of like focusing say on synapses onto interneurons that these would be more shaft synapses rather than synapses onto excitatory neurons which are probably more biased towards spine synapses. I think that's sort of one way to go at it. I mean I think there's there's certainly other ways is and but that's the we're absolutely interested in. I think there is clearly also presynaptic diversity. I mean, at a minimum, we sort of know that there's a lot of heterogeneity presynaptically for like release probabilities, how they're facilitating or depressing. And that might be reflected in their like KV channel expression and their which could like tie into this. And I think that's somewhat, that that hasn't been explored as much. Like, which is also sort of like highlights that tools to look at potassium and put changes in potassium are still really limited. Uh, yeah, so to develop those tools, I know I met Peter Higeman at you know, a different conference. He's really nice and open to collaborate, to develop like specific tools for biologists. You know, he was one of the fathers of optogenetic, but he's still really doing a lot of cool work to like generate specific new optogenetic tools for different approaches. You should maybe contact him. Okay. Yeah, he's really nice and he's like really open to like he makes now some that are far out in the um in the spectrum to like get different wavelengths. Yeah. That they don't overlap and stuff, but he's he, he's really nice and open to collaborate with really cool biological new questions. So I think if you contact him okay. he will- yeah, he he's really nice. And um, another question I had was, you know, I was working on a project. The idea was that um, these pockets of different ions, like I was more on the chloride inhibitory side, that the extra synaptic or the the uh, that they could um, represent some type of 
extracellular memory, a short term or even long term, do you think that these potassium pockets, you know, accumulate? Like, do you have an evidence that kind of accumulates and holds like another form of memory in the astrocytes so that they are involved in like short term, long term memory through these uh, potassium accumulation yeah. pockets? So, I mean, I think the closest what we have is sort of, we still think that sort of at least a decent chunk of our effect on glutamate transporters on how they slow with neuronal activity is probably through this potassium buildup. And so we know that sort of persists on the order of 30 milliseconds or so. Uh, sort of, we know that if we just sort of space a stimuli longer than that, sort of it quickly starts to recover. So, I mean, that sort of at least provides a very short term, sort of a much short term, like memory effect of it. I think there is, I mean, I think one of the things that would be really exciting to me sort of on the like memory effect is also like how this affects neighboring synapses. And I think that that's, it's a fascinating question, but it's also something that's really hard, hard to make tractable because it's sort of, you would imagine that sort of this potassium is going to diffuse out and sort of if you have it active enough, it's going to sort of at least very locally like spill onto the next synapse, but it's sort of what or like depolarize the like astrocyte process a couple microns onto for the next synapse. But sort of the question is like, where is that next synapse from? Because it's, now it's really what is in spatially like the closest synapse question, which is sort of something that I don't think people normally think about that much because since they're like all intermixed and sort of in no way has to be from the same, same neuron or even a close by neuron, it could be a completely different path. Because it's really just like, what's what's closest in the torturous shape of the extracellular space so i'm i'm not sure i'm not currently in the in the field anymore but is there somebody working on a specific potassium indicator like not general voltage or positive there, bands so. yes so there there were two that were published uh, at least on bioarchive in the last six months, one from Ed Boyden's group and one from Yi Shen and Robert Campbell's group. And sort of, I mean, we've talked with both of them and sort of both of them sort of say sort of that it's a really hard problem. And sort of what they've gotten is sort of they've they've gotten ones that might work okay intracellularly uh, and with various caveats of still ph dependence sort of like they're on i think they're on the like cusp of really being useful the sort of unfortunate thing that's really still missing is the nobody seems to be able to get them to work extracellularly which would be for us would be fantastic but sort of i know both those groups and another one in austria have sort of tried and nobody has managed to make any progress on that so far and from what i've heard is sort of like on the tool side it's been a little bit of a dead end Oh, okay. Would there be a way to just, you know, I, I worked I would on. I love to have those and, tools, essentially. Yeah, I worked on Clomelion for a while, and we tried to with George Augustine, and then 
we try to like tag chromelion to extracellular and intracellular like receptors but then on two sides like yeah. on one the extra but it kind of was challenging the contract was getting kind of really big to express it and keep the cells healthy but maybe there would be a way for, for testing to just tag a fret type of genetic indicator to yeah. the extracellular side of a receptor the, the the problem as i understand it is that they w once these sensors go through the er they seem to completely lose their function and through the speculation is through palmitolation or some other modifications but of essentially essential amino acids in the potassium sensing domain of it. So, I mean, we, we've gotten them to traffic extracellularly, but then they, but unfortunately they always lose their function. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, 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 it's something we've been following closely, but it's sort of... At some at some point, we said we're not experts in developing these tools, and sort of if I mean Ed Boyden's lab and Robert Campbell's lab both are do fantastic work in developing these fluorescent sensors. If they tell us that this is isn't happening quickly, I somewhat take their word. Yeah, for, it. for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm sorry I took over the stage. So Serena and everyone else, please go ahead and ask questions. Thank you. <laughs> so, well, those were fascinating questions. Um, I wanted to pick up on um, well, a question you even raised. Um, you know, what in terms of the the spatiotemporal effects of this potassium burst, and and what are what are the um, you know, the neighboring synapses pick up and, you know, do pathways get crossed? But what was, I, I'm still connecting the, um, so the synapse and that initial potassium burst, that's going to depolarize locally, uh, but that depolarization ex still extends over microns. And so, um, you know, then it's not just the immediate neighborhood uh, does the depolarization of the adjacent processes then affect, um, I guess ultimately you're looking at glutamate clearance rates in other synapses? Or does it, or how does it affect other synapses? Because I'm ultimately looking for how does neural synchrony get driven? And is this a possible mechanism for that? So, I mean... Partially, partially, it's we haven't found a tractable mechanism to test it, and sort of if if we sort of stimulate two different pathways, uh, sets sets of axons onto a single astrocyte, so sort of we get very we get almost no overlaps in the depolarization or on the glutamate effects, but that is sort of doesn't directly answer it because sort of we don't really know like what the like average distance between those synapses are. I mean that's sort of the question would really be is sort of can you find the the closest adjacent synapse when and that's sort of there just isn't a labeling technique to really get at that clearly cleanly at least for us. So I mean it's that's what's sort of like has been sort of like stopping us from like really going gung ho after that because we just haven't had a clearly tractable experiment for it. But that said, I think it's an absolutely fascinating question, and I think I mean one one way to sort of try to get at that would be sort of a bit of like computational modeling to sort of see like how big of a spread do you really need to affect something 
I mean, there there are at least like computational models of like diffusion or like space mm -hmm. space constants that could be harnessed. I see. So you really can't set the experiment up to know that two synapses on different pathways are close to each other. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's sort of a be best case would be sort of like hunting in the haystack to sort uh -huh. of like I mean, sparsely labeled sort of so that you can pick up individual like synapses and it sort of it might be possible in a very very low throughput manner and sort of in the end we've there have been more more tractable experiments to keep us busy <laughs> Well, well, but does so then doesn't the time dependence of the same synapse sort of indicate so if you're getting a decreased glutamate clearance rate or increased rather yes. um, near in time to the event and that depolarization uh, propagates over distances wouldn't near neighboring synapse uh, have a modulated glutamate clearance rate whether they're firing or not. Katarina, you got a hot mic. It, 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 it depends on on exactly how close and sort of. I mean, I guess the other thing that it really depends on is the like astrocyte ultrastructure of is it really like a branch that comes out touches one synapse and a different like branch coming out touching another one, or is it sort of more sort of a bit like an axon of like one branch passes through passes a couple synapses and, is, and sort of like and sheaths one after the other i mean i think that would sort of also like give dramatically different mm -hmm. different effects but you did say that was but so those hot spots though that you imaged those were over microns so whatever yeah. the bushiness topography is there's going to be multiple, many synapses in that region that are all in the quote blast zone, right? Yes, with, with so sort of, I th I think our the like micron size might be a bit overestimation just due to like uh our micro because it's sort of like it's the, like true depolarization size is convoluted with our like point spread function, so. Mm -hmm. which is going to make it look bigger because we know sort of the like for example the width our width that we measure is half a micron or so well we sort of know that the width of like an astrocyte the small astrocyte processes is down to like 100 nanometers so sort of we can't i i think our estimation is probably a little overestimation just due to like imaging effects but that said i think it probably should spill onto a neighboring synapse if you can catch a close enough one okay so then does the i understand what kicks off the calcium waves is the uh, there's potassium calcium exchange so does this initial calcium or sorry potassium blast um if it's repeated and in, in, in pumped, so there's you know an active neuron pumping a lot of potassium activity, does that build up as in kind of an integrative function and get the calcium waves going? That is a good question of, I mean, we haven't seen it. So if, if we take our same preparation and do astrocyte calcium imaging, we don't really get a repeatable calcium signal. I think sort of there's, unfortunately, there's also there's a, a plethora of things that initiate calcium signals from like ER calcium to to pumps to potential calcium channels to, so I mean, I think it's sort of like back to our like pre discussion. I think a, a lot of it probably depends on exactly what state. Mm -hmm. the, astrocyte is in i would guess that this potassium buildup can certainly contribute but it's sort of it's not 
it's not a one-to-one -one correlation of we build up potassium, we get a calcium break, at least. And so there's, there's something more complicated to that. <laughs> yeah, that strikes me as just glaringly interesting and, so, and mysterious, is that you can't even get a reproducible calcium wave. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they're all over the place. But yeah, what I, I, we... <laughs> I mean, sort of, you, you, there's, as far as I know, there's almost no astrocyte calcium papers that have used a stimulator. <laughs> and and I, I think there's a good reason for that. And I mean, we haven't got. I think so too. Stimulator. Whatever that answer is, yeah. But um, so, uh, okay. I, I mean, there, there's clearly something interesting going on. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. I want to give some other people a chance to speak, but I'll have more if it if um, later. Hi, doctor. Um, may I ask a question, please? Um, first of all, that was an incredible talk. I only learned about astrocytes just being uh, in the Science Society here, so I'm learning a lot here with this talk and with Serena's inquiries and from before. And my question for you. Um, is, is there um, a rhyme or reason um, to the sheathing of synapses uh, by the astrocytes? Like, is there a, um, any sort of predictability to what they attach to and why? That is a good question. Um, the, so, there, the ensheathment is certainly plastic. Of, I mean, there's some good papers that sort of show that you, you can like retract them and sort of they're also like respond to like normal activity through like long-term potentiation that i think if i'm trying to remember correctly also retracts it so i mean there's it's definitely an active thing and it's definitely sort of responds to activity in some manner uh, but i don't think we have a really, really clear understanding of like what differentiates an ensheathed synapse versus an unensheathed synapse in terms of their activity or any other properties. I, it's also partially in that like you need you need EM images to really establish the sheath to some extent. I see. So, um, so as it stands at the moment, then all we know is that astrocytes do attach to things, uh, you know, um, to the synapses and things, but they can attach to certain areas more than others for no reason that we know so far. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I mean, yeah. we, there, there uh, there's a couple interesting manipulations have been like found. One, one, um, really interesting one was these gap junction proteins. So these sort of like form like cell to cell in, intracellular connections. And if you astrocytes express a lot of these and these sort of connect astrocytes in a syncytium. And one of the interesting and curious effects of knocking out one of these gap junction proteins was that astrocytes, for example, really pushed their processes that into the synaptic cleft. So like almost like super sheathed and sort of like tried to like go even further into the synapse. And oh, wow. So um, th that definitely like one was one of the like really curious and interesting manipulations of this. That's incredible. Because I remember um, Serena, I believe, mentioned something about, was it Serena Einstein's brain that there was astrocytes, a higher deposit of astrocytes or something in the part of the brain that involved um Well, that was, a find, that, that was a finding out of the autopsy, yeah. yeah but no, yeah. It's, it's fascinating that, I, I mean, I hadn't heard of that. That's, uh, so you, you block their gap junctions and cut them off from the syncytium and they just drive further into the synapse. <laughs> yes, this, this was, let me pull it up. This was a paper from, I think, Natalie Roche. And it was, I believe, con knocking out Connexin 43. And yeah, it essentially tried to, the, the astrocyte sort of tries to push into the synaptic cleft.
oh wow that's a bizarre type of regulation there yes exactly <laughs> absolutely <laughs> I'm wondering if at some point in the future we might find uh, that in terms of like our own health, we'll have to take care of, you know, not just like, you know, brain health and body health, but like astrocyte health or something. The more we discover about these things, they seem quite remarkable. Thank you very much for taking my questions, Doctor. Are there others? Um, flash your mic if you have other questions. Oh, Dr. Shah. Yes, thank you so much uh, for the, I mean, fascinating research that you shared with us. So actually, I, I, I was just wondering about the clinical use of that and a couple of the doubts came to me. First of all, I just thought about some of the disease, for example, such as Huntington disease, that we have, a, I mean, problem with the potassium, I mean, repolarization somehow, and this type of the neurodegenerative disease somehow in alzheimer disease and the re recent research that they had through the alzheimer disease they just found the function of the astrocyte and dual function of the astrocyte so i was just thinking about because you talk about the excess of the glutamate extra glutamate and potassium level and somehow that's not clear and so in the clinical level if you cannot inhibit that and because you mentioned about the optimization so do you have any extra, I mean, information that you can share with us in, a, I mean, some of the disease that, that might be related with your research? Um, I, I mean, I, can point, I think sort of the potassium mechanism sort of definitely has a lot of connection. And sort of the one we're going after is sort of epilepsy, but I think there's, many other connections, Alzheimer's certainly being one. There's, in terms of like, really fascinating studies on sort of the like, potass potential potassium effects, one that I can point to is there's a study from Highland Hu, whose lab, that sort of really ties these potassium changes in those surrounding neurons to depression. And that was a really, really exciting paper that came out a few years ago from her lab, really looking at like this KR 4.1 channel that buffers a lot of the potassium in, in a completely different brain region in the lateral habenula. And I mean, Alzheimer's definitely affects glutamate clearance. I think it's been a bit less studied on the potassium front, but sort of the like a, a beta peptide can, I think, directly interact with the glutamate transporters to inhibit them, for example. That's been published as well. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of interactions and, and sort of how all all of these sort of like ultra structure that a lot of this sort of like depends on changes in these, in these neurodegenerative disorders is I think also a really interesting question. Because yes, because when we are thinking about the glutamine glutamate cycle versus the, I mean, on the other side of that is a GABA, but you exactly talk about the potassium, you had to emphasize on potassium and potassium in relationship with astrocytes and that's why i was just curious more specifically about i mean diseases related with the astrocyte and the dual nature of the astrocyte yeah no i i completely agree and i mean i think there's more and more work being done on sort of the like astrocyte component of these diseases is and how it contributes and i mean i think that's definitely something we're trying to go after as well uh, uh, and it, but yeah, and so I don't have too much other to really like share on that front. And so our work is still on the like early days there. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, hi, uh, thanks uh, for this, uh, you know, um, wonderful uh, presentation and uh, 
uh, presenting this uh, very interesting research on exercise. I, uh, I, I myself also learned a lot. Uh, I have a question um, for to understand uh, the work better that uh, the uh, pathway specific uh, keywords in, in your abstract refers to that uh, so far seems to be uh, uh, can I take it as a more a uh, uh, it's a kind of responsive role playing uh, the by astrocytes to the upstream to the uh, by the neuron and then uh, there isn't a, a correlation so far uh, found and uh, in your conclusion that uh, the uh, seems that uh, uh, there is I'm curious uh, the uh, the uh, the role uh, at, at this point yeah so the uh, uh, clearing uh, of uh, potassium um, potassium uh, uh, and uh, ions and uh, others the uh, what what is the uh, could could you a, a little bit uh, more what is the specific potential for uh, modifying the the synapse uh, plasticity the I mean uh, already we know that it plays roles in say uh, uh repairing and uh, does it take a role on the, uh, 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 uh say uh like a neuron type of uh, uh role that's just a maybe it's uh, you know not uh ask the right uh, question but uh, just uh, from my own learning so so the pathway specificity is in more what was this one experiment where sort of we can put two stimulators in our brain slice to sort of activate ascending versus sort of lateral like inputs and mostly to show that sort of the depolarizations or the glutamate effects that we saw were didn't spill from one from one stimulator's effects onto the other sort of that then we got the hotspots we found were not overlapping or the glutamate effects didn't spill from one pathway to the other. M more or less sort of like trying to get at sort of the question of like, is it a larger area or that is sort of spilling on or is it highly focal? So, and sort of to the question of like, can this sort of be modulated and sort of like modulatory? I. I think so. And I mean, I think partially to some extent, it's, it's novel territory to go after of what, what like this potassium buildup actually does to the neuron. And, and sort of, you'd think that sort of like, it could, it could affect release, presynaptic release for train different patterns of activity for sure. But it's something that hasn't really been explored yet because I think just because the effect was unknown. And I think there is definitely potential of like interventions of sort of if we get a better handle on how astrocytes clear the potassium, that could give a new like new crank to turn on changing these, this build up in one way or the other and to sort of use that as a tool to modulate or change change the neuronal states thank you well wouldn't the um the impact on the glutamate release impact the um the, the postsynaptic um is there a coupling between the postsynaptic um, potentiation and the rate of clearance of uh, glutamate surprisingly the like postsynaptic side seems to be somehow uncoupled from it so there's a really interesting paper out very recently from Matthew Parsons 
in Canada. Um, essentially looking at glutamate and then glutamate clearance and like what what the presynaptic side sees versus what the postsynaptic side sees. And sort of the presynaptic side seem, seems to be much more sensitive to any disruptions. While the postsynaptic side does it seems completely invariant. It's sort of there's clearly something interesting going on there. We just don't have a good handle on it. I was thinking about this recently. Uh, there's some recent work suggesting that there's a little more compartmentalization going on in the cleft than maybe we realized. Um, like one of the lines of effort is, is about uh, transsynaptic proteins. Uh, yeah, and yeah, go ahead. Yes, I mean, well, there, yeah. there, there, there's been really nice work sort of showing that there is like transsynaptic alignment of release sites to postsynaptic receptors. And it's yeah. one of the really, really nice things that has come out of sort of advances in super resolution microscopy. So, so with this triune synapse, I, my thoughts go to where exactly are, um, is this action happening uh, in terms of, because I know there's a lot of uh, work showing, in, uh, you know, strongly coupled interactions between astrocytes and the presynaptic terminal. Uh, and then the question is, you know, what, where exactly are the receptors that are getting signals from from astrocytic release uh and you know like this 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 kind of spatial detail might be critical to talking about why it would be more pre versus post synaptic i i i completely agree and that's our thinking as well it's it's just on a size scale that makes it not untractable but not easy <laughs> In that, I mean, we're talking uh, on the orders of tens of nanometers of differences that probably play a, ro a critical role. Well, you know, I did some work a few years back on um, uh, the uh, the cannabinoid receptor, and uh, it's you know the endocannabinoids, uh, arachidonic acid, more in the brain, but in the peripheral, it's more. Uh, to acylglycerol, but um, it's you know would function as a retrograde messenger. In 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 the um, astrocytes express a cannabinoid receptor as well. It's curious. I mean, you you mentioned it. There may be some differentiation in the astrocytes as far as what gets expressed presynaptically versus postsynaptically, um, or I wonder if it's a temporal effect that um, the postsynaptic is releasing the you know, the arachidonic acid, and that's actually um, activating those cannabinoid receptors, both presynaptically and on the astrocytes. And if that has some modulation, it would be interesting to, um, to see. Yeah, He's no, been I studying completely, neurons. I completely I, agree. I, go ahead. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I mean, I, it's something we've been aware of, and we sort of we dip our toes from time to time, but sort of we haven't had something jump out enough to sort of pursue it at the moment but it's i think i think it's definitely an interesting thing interesting aspect and something to follow up on so it's fascinating that you um and and in, you know please anybody just flash your mic if you have other questions. <laughs> I'll just keep going. Um, so you you're saying, or you found that um, locally that depolarization is is up to twenty millivolts on the astrocyte, but when you patched the soma, you'd only um, it was more like two. It was it was much less. Is that, it's, so is that like the soma is really just sort of a buffering kind of activity, but but all of the uh, the actual signal is local and and very temporal yeah, yes to some extent sort of it, it's also the 
soma depolarization is very different mechanistically. So the soma depolarization is purely a like a current uh, is purely like a inward potassium current causing it. So if you block the inward potassium current, you there's very little left at the soma. So it, it's really sort of a, a split between the, the soma sort of like integrates like the current coming into the astrocyte from the, a lot of the astrocyte or all of the astrocyte while the processes, since the depolarization is mostly sort of the extracellular buildup of potassium. So th th that's really sort of the like split between it, the two of like the extracellular build of potassium is never, never spatially big enough to sort of ever get to or affect the soma because the soma is sort of away from not like touching a synapse. So, so, so really the signal is, it's not the influx of potassium, it's just the, um, the voltage okay. depolarization of the temporal event. Exactly. For it, it's the extracellular buildup rather than the influx that's causing the processes to depolarize. So this leads me to a question. Is there a more um, localized and gene expression modulation and uh, mitochondria out there? Are they more focused on the... There's, there's mitochondria out there, which sort of like barely, barely fits into these processes. There's, there was a paper five years ago now that did sort of localize gene expression in the processes versus the soma. I mean, I'm vaguely recalling it. I think there were some differences. I forget exactly what what jumped out from that from that assay. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing to sort of appreciate as well is sort of a lot of these proteins, especially the glutamate transporters, are very, very highly expressed. And there's, they're extremely densely expressed on astrocytes. So there have been some really nice papers sort of like quantifying their density and their expression level and sort of the two forms of the astrocyte of the astrocytic glutamate transporters together comprise about one and a half percent of the total brain protein by themselves so you can already sort of picture that these are have to be packed in there incredibly densely yeah so so my question kind of is i'm thinking about if they, you know, if the time scale of the depolarization in the soma is so short, and I assume there's not much calcium release, then, like, is there some sort of, you know, how, how does gene expression change to adapt to, you know, it, environmental changes and the environmental change or other neurons and, and stuff like that? So, like if it's yeah yeah it can I be mean, much I guess trying stronger. to get at what 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 the like downstream signals yeah from exactly the, this is. from this activity like um because yeah. the ATP production changes uh, based on you know a lot of neural activity around them like a lot of potassium or not like yeah I don't know is there a good thing is there a way to monitor that maybe like uh atp put local atp production is there an indicator for that i'm sorry if i keep asking me. there are some there they're mixed the of mixed mixed usefulness <laughs> yes, i mean they're I haven't followed that literature as closely. I mean, I think that's definitely in, would be interesting. And then, I mean, a lot of this is, but has to be like energetic of like the role, especially with the like sodium potassium pumps 
which get highly co-localized with the glutamate transporters. So, I mean, there has to be significant ATP demand there for sure. And, and that could definitely signal. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think anybody's really tried to do that yet. But oh, that would be really interesting, I think, to like see local ATP. Yeah, I agree. How long they exist, maybe? Like with, you know, let's say, I don't know, with long-term depression versus potential. If there's something going on like that, and if you could, if it would reflect maybe in, in local ATP production, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think the whole metabolomic cycle in the brain is sort of getting more and more attention as well of, of that this is highly regulated and highly dynamic. So there's a brain initiative grant to make a good ATP indicator. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the, the one that I know is there, there, there's one that uses uh, luciferase to sort of, um, my PhD lab was using it to sort of do bioluminescence to measure ATP. And then there's a couple of FRET ATP ADP sensors that are out there. So, I mean, there, there, there are some at least starting points for these tools. So now when you said, um, so during the depolarization, is that glutamate clearance rate um, increasing or decreasing? Decreasing, it gets slower. It's slower. So um, the more active that presynaptic neuron is, uh, um, the less efficient glutamate will be cleared. Exactly. It's a counterintuitively a positive feedback loop. Right. So that serves to amplify the signal at the postsynaptic side. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, which is really cool. And Unless you get a lot of inhibitory neurons, you know. Right, right. Yeah. So yeah. does this work the same way for the astrocytes that are expressing GABA receptors? So GABA transporters are clear GABA. So GABA transport is generally a lot slower than glutamate transport. And it's sort of, as far as I understand it, it's halfway split between GABA getting cleared by neurons and versus getting, and getting cleared by astrocytes. So it doesn't seem to be Similarly, it definitely has a different modulation than glutamate. So it doesn't have the same like, positive feedback loop. That said, I think it's been a lot less studied than glutamate clearance. So there may be things that we just haven't found yet. Well, don't the astrocytes also, they also express the GABA B receptor, right? Yes, they also express the GABA B receptor. I don't know, honestly, that too much about what comes downstream from there. Yeah. And, and that may be um, regionally specific. I, I remember reading a paper about the medial prefrontal cortex inner neurons. But and you I were studying. Also, like in the hippocampus, is, I think mm -hmm. the GABA B expression is fairly broad it's sort of sort of it's been this sort of like perpetual questions and astrocyte of they seem to express a lot of stuff especially if you like look at the expression studies so that there's like nmda receptors there's the gaba b receptors they sort of really get nailing down a re reproducible function to them is has been yeah they they listen to everything exactly <laughs> Well, um, and but so you were studying uh, cort cortical neurons, right? Yes. Yeah, and because there's different morphologies, right, of the astrocytes depending on where they they are. Absolutely. So I mean, the like glutamate effects of it, 
there another lab, the Parsons lab, and they looked at different brain regions. And the hippocampus is much more resistant to it, for example. And but the like, cortex and the striatum were both both have this like an slowing of glutamate clearance to a strong effect. That's interesting, especially also in the striatum, because there's so much inhibition going on in the striatum. It's crazy. So it's interesting that the astrocytes are probably the only thing that kind of counteract. Huh, okay. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like even the output is inhibitory. <laughs> <laughs> like the projection neurons express like it's it's funny but um the the interesting part is about the GABA B receptors because they are G protein coupled so they yeah kind of you know int as opposed to introduce like some intracellular signaling and maybe change gene expression so yeah it would be really cool to to locally so I read, I was at the conference and there was like this German lab, which I forgot, I have to look it up, that was looking, that was working on very local um, optogenetics that you could stimulate, but in a culture mostly, with like nano LEDs very locally and change gene expression very locally with like nano oh, LSD. Cool. Yeah, so you could basically at the synapse um, inhibit or activate specific genes, like let's say GABA B and stop yeah. like, um, yeah, expression over time just there. It was through the lo love, L-O-V. Ah, okay. Like, I think I've come across them at some point. You could probably do this with an optical strategy too. Yeah, yeah, with op uh, yeah, would, yeah. Exactly. so you they had like strings of nano LEDs. They could program them without having cables and whatnot, um, because they had this tiny uh, uh, receptors for signaling. So you know you didn't need a fiber into the culture. You had the strings of LEDs, and you could program them to let's say you know um have different patterns of lights on and off uh, throughout the culture basically like along the dendrite it would be cool to also do that in astrocyte yeah that mm. would definitely be interesting that's a cool cool assay <laughs> yeah yeah i have to look up which lab it was and then what they did with it because they were kind of looking at the conference for labs that would kind of apply it more. They were all, they are all these bioengineering labs, a lot of them in Germany, and they kind of were looking for collaborations to apply all these new fancy tools. So that <laughs> yeah. would be cool. <laughs> so, but it's in a culture and you do acute brain slices usually, right? Yeah, so, so astrocytes, it, it, I mean, essentially the, the issue is that a lot of this really depends on that, like, that ensheathment, like, ultrastructure around synapses, and that, that just isn't replicated in cultures for the most part. So astrocytes get a much flatter, less ramified morphology in, the, in cultures. Is it extra complicated to work with them in slice, like, above and beyond? what we do to keep neurons alive in the slice? No, not, not particularly. I mean, they okay. don't last quite as long as neurons for like good patching and then patching astrocytes is a little bit finicky, but all in all, they're easy to handle. So not much worse than dealing with inner neurons, maybe something like that. Yeah, no, not, not particularly worse. If you can patch inner neurons, you'll be able to patch astrocytes. And image them. imaging is might might even be easier. Sort of the the neat thing is that they tile, so they don't overlap, which 
Oh, that's it's, awesome. That is, amazing. that's a dream. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm assuming, I just haven't uh, thought about this uh, in detail. I'm assuming there's quite a few, maybe like GCAMP six lines for astrocytes. And I'm, I'm wondering if how specific uh, in terms of different cell types, be, you know, between uh, so, uh, among the astrocytes. Yeah, so there's there's a couple mouse G camp mouse lines. They've honestly fallen a bit out of favor in in preference of viral work, just out of G camps and everything else is advancing so quickly. The mice can never. So yeah, off. same same for neurons. Uh, we're we're doing viral G camp eight just because we don't want to deal with six anymore. It, 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 exactly. So, I mean, there's virally, unfortunately, there's a little bit limits in limited promoters to work with for astrocytes. It's pretty much only this modified GFAP. That said, it expresses fairly specifically to astrocytes whenever you express like a sensor. There's so I mean, it's fairly straightforward to express the newest G camp, they usually have them straight at ad gene, like a GFAP version of a lot of the viruses. Uh, I have a, a question on the, um, the car, uh, uh, compartil, compartil, uh, uh, compartmentalization part mentioned earlier by Wisdom that uh, the um, so I understand that that uh, you know, your work is focusing on the cortical uh, distal uh, uh, type of uh, astrocytes. So within the or even uh, more general uh, glia cells, the at uh, other locations, uh, uh, say uh, hippo uh, uh, thalamus that. Uh, would uh, would it be possible to think that uh, at the lower level that uh, they take on a more active role, say uh, much mod more modulation that they can participate? Would that be a meaningful uh, uh, question to ask? Um, I mean, I don't know too much about hypothalamic astrocytes. I mean, I know they, for example, they can retract or extend their processes, I think, much more than in, in what's been shown in cortical astrocytes. But, I mean, I would hazard a guess that, yes, that, that they're probably going to be active players as well. Uh, and would be interesting to go after. I mean, everything I know of them sort of, like, suggests that they, they already have be as much or more active interaction and changes in morphology than cortical astrocytes. No, uh, uh, what, 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 can you could you repeat the last uh, uh, statement? They, they they don't or they do? I think they do. I see. Yeah. So the, so I I think sort of there there's various assays which cause them to like shrink shrink and retract from synapses much more than what's been seen in the cortex. That's interesting. Thank you. I'm going to have to say goodbye really soon. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I, I was about to ask, <laughs> you know, I've been going for a long time. So, um, yeah, thank you so okay. much. for ask one last question? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, with these retraction events, um, has it been seen for them to return to synapses or, or is there like a, a rate in which these, the, the triune synapses are replaced or it, once they retract, is that usually the end I, of it? I think they come back, but I'm honestly not completely on top of that literature. Yeah, that, me either. That's why I asked. But it, it, it's really interesting to me because I, I, I study dendrites and these retraction events are like, uh, without getting into the causes or, you know, functional role of it or anything like that, 
Uh, the effect certainly is to reduce synapse spe specificity. So you get this spillover and you could have these plasticity induction events that are now affecting multiple synapses uh, on a branch and synapses that weren't involved in the induction process uh, yeah. explicitly. Yeah. So, and, and if they come back, now we have this really interesting dynamic system for potentially clustering synapses on, on branches and things. I've been thinking about it in, in that light. Yeah, I completely agree. Does ARC influence that at all? Do you know? It's a more Th more... Does what? Sorry. ARC? Does ARC influence the retraction at all? I was, gonna, a... I was going to ask about what triggers the retraction, actually. I, don't, I didn't... I don't know sorry, on a mechanistic ahead. level. <laughs> so not a terrible question, then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. So does the retraction, like a faulty mechanism and retraction contribute to epilepsy then? Because you also are involved in epilepsy research, right? Yes. Um, good question. Um, honestly, we don't know that much. I mean, on first... So, at least in a couple models, no, but but honestly, I'm not sure it would be the answer. Okay, cool. Interesting. Next, <laughs> there's still a lot to know. So you exactly. won't. Nobody will be out of job here <laughs> in the near future. That's job job security. Yep. <laughs> Don't ask too many, don't solve too many questions for someone more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's plenty left. Yeah, I think there's a lot left. So, yeah, thank you so much for taking so much time and answering all of our questions and for sharing your really interesting research. I wish you all the funding and that you get a lot of helping hands. <laughs> and thank you, and thank you for having me. <laughs> Yeah, this Thank was so you. Yeah, this was fascinating. We could certainly keep asking questions, but we'll respect your time. Yeah. Maybe you come you back much. with some updates on your research. Sure. Yes, Maybe. do come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe there will be a great breakthrough for potassium indicators. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. If that comes out, I'll certainly be back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye, Moritz. Bye. And yeah, thank you everyone for being here and asking so many questions, um, interesting questions. Um, and uh, we really appreciate it. If you like discussions like this, follow the club, Science Society. And we will have, um, of course, more rooms in the future. We'll have actually tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. EST Dr. Kiehi. He developed uh, self-assembled logic secrets from proteins, which will be really interesting. Then we'll have um, Dr. Steve Kihu. He is talking about the expansion of desert climate in Central Asia. So it will be a climate change related room. And on Friday, we'll have Dr. Kagan talking about uh, gene mutations across species and how they shed light on aging in humans. And um, yeah, this is our rest of the week. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Special thanks to Moritz again. We really, this was an amazing discussion. And um, yeah, hear you all back soon. Hopefully, bye everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye bye.